Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, and uh, so here for another show. So this is uh, my first show back from a little brief hiatus of about, I don't know, five weeks, I guess, six weeks. Um, and and the friends of mine on Facebook, um, on both the personal and wine side, and, and, and people who follow me on Twitter, though it wasn't as... as um, didn't communicate as much on Twitter about it. Uh, we'll know that uh, very significant things happened in in mine and my father's life is that my mother passed away back in April. Um, right after uh, I had come back from Rockport on a vacation, um, I had recorded an episode in Rockport, um, and uh, I didn't feel like resuming with that episode because it's it's very lighthearted and it's you know having some fun fun which you know I love having to do and, and love love having fun uh, I just didn't feel it was appropriate for me to resume my shows with that and just have a little intro to kind of explain what was going on uh, I just didn't feel like it was gonna be the right mood so I, I decided that I wanted to do an episode where at least I could explain what happened um, I don't need to go into the details, just that, that, that the event has happened. And I wanted to have um, some wines that um, were somewhat of an honor to my mother. Now, my mother wasn't a huge wine drinker. Um, uh, this, okay, so a few things to come out. What, obviously, I don't have the green screen set up. Uh, here in the house, uh, this was the chair that she usually liked to sit in. Um, uh, right next to the television. Um, the same chair that she would sit in when I would do my reviews from the very beginning. I've been doing the show for almost four years now. Matter of fact, next week is the anniversary of this podcast, of this wine show, uh, four years. Um, and, uh, the dining room table is in that direction. And, uh, you know, I would do lots of all, you know, out of the 200 and some odd reviews that I've had almost, almost 300 reviews. You know, she was here for a lot of them, and she would listen to it. My father would listen to it. I'd have to tell him to be quiet because I didn't have the, the microphone set up. It was just the camera. Um, so she'd hear a lot of the reviews, and, and my father would hear a lot of reviews. And, and uh, afterwards, I'd get some, uh, some feedback, you know, some of it, you know, good, some of it not as good to let me know, like, especially about pace and, and how I was speaking and not just the... Not just the content, because we would watch a lot of these things later, and the, the, the content comments would happen later. But many times, I would, uh, <coughs> you know, after, <coughs> sorry, after uh, tasting these wines, I would bring the glass over and uh, on some of the wines, not all of them, but on some of the wines, especially when I was doing the one wine a show, type of thing and I'd be like here taste this and one thing that especially at first when uh, when I first moved down here uh, and started doing these shows that was real evident is, is my mother had an, uh, a great palate just naturally great she didn't there was no training involved there was no practice there was no you know you know drinking and tasting hundreds of wines just to start developing things I mean granted I I gave a little coaching in the sense of of maybe what things to say about stuff, but um, she had an amazing, amazing nose and palate, uh, which, which is not uncommon for women. Women um, are just uh, known for being able to smell and taste, uh, not that they can smell and taste more than men, but just seem to be more attuned to it uh, naturally. And uh, it was really nice to, to get those things because there would be things, especially with white wines, I would struggle uh, being able to pick up stuff. And then I would have her tell me what she would smell and taste and whether she liked it or not, which uh, with red wine, she didn't really like a lot of red wines. Uh, uh, or I wouldn't say she didn't like them, but it wasn't her preference. She'd rather have a white wine than a red wine. I, mean, I can remember growing up, uh, she would do the dreaded ice cubes in the wine, uh, which she didn't do later on. But <clears throat> I can remember as a kid, <coughs> that's what you do with white wine. You put ice cubes in it. And this is, you know, the 70s. Um, but, uh, you know, she would tell me stuff and I would use that information to help me because then I would immediately 
smell and taste the wine after she did to see if I got the same things. Um, you know, she would have, you know, great descriptions and, and, uh, and if and sometimes I liked the wine she didn't, she would turn, usually, usually the red wines, but even some of the white wines. So I wanted to go with, with wines that I felt that, um, she would hopefully like. Also, um, you know, she was half Irish or the English, the British Isles, and except for Wales for some reason. At least that's with the family lore, how I remember it has been. But the other half has been the Germanic and Slavic part of, of, of Europe. And I used to joke with friends that, you know, I'm a mutt and, you know, dad's Italian and mom's the rest of Europe. Um, not exactly true, obviously, because I don't have any, far as I know, French and Spanish and Polish and that stuff. But, you know, back in the day in the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, I mean, they... People conquered and reconquered and moved around. So who knows about Central and Southern Europe and and Western Europe and Eastern Europe? Who you know who where, where everybody came from? But basically, you know that's that's the uh, that's the um, uh, heritage. So I wanted to go with uh, an Austrian wine and a German wine. Um, so uh, uh, and really just because um, one they're easier for me to obtain than getting something that's uh, a Slovakian or Slovenian. Um, white wines, especially rather than reds, I can get I can get the uh, Slovenian red wines fairly easily, um, but <clears throat> because there's a gentleman here that distributes them in San Antonio, who uh, uh, I've had some of their wines and they're excellent, by the way. And yes, we'll Gregor will finally some point in time meet not meet, but we've already met, but get you on the show. Um, it's on the long list of places and people and things that I want to have on the show, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but I wanted to, to get into the wines that I felt that she would um, uh, like. And uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's the deal. Um, like I said, I won't go through all the details of, about what happened, just that, that uh, uh, she did pass away. Um, uh, and it was one of the main reasons why I moved back to San Antonio because of, uh, of her uh, getting cancer. Um, in 2007, I moved down here in 2008. So... Um, <clears throat> Let's so just go ahead and uh, get started uh, with with the show. Um, so the first one, uh, first wine we got, and I'll have pictures of this here in a second. Oh, pictures somewhere up there. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Schloss Kellerei Goebelsberg. Uh, that's the winery. Uh, Goebelsberg Gruner Veltliner from the Comptal part of Austria, the Osterreich. Uh, or is it Osterreich? I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm not sure how the Australians pronounce their German or their Austrian. It's, you know, Austrian and German are effectively the same. Not quite. Um, but Gruner Veltliner is, uh, and we'll show that, but I'll have a picture of the bottle. Uh, 2010. Uh, Gruner Veltliner is the kind of national grape of Austria. Uh, it's also found in Slovakia and, Czech, and the Czech Republic. Um, and Comptal uh, <clears throat> um, is an area of Austria, uh, almost, it's kind of like, <clears throat> okay, so the wine areas of Austria are kind of like a mirror image of Germany. So all the, almost all of the main German wine areas are in the southwestern part of Germany, uh, near the border of France. Um, Alsace, you know, the Germans and the French have fought over the Alsace-Lorraine region for centuries, and they've changed hands a few times. Um, and there's a couple wine areas in the western part, southern western part of Germany that nobody really ever talks about, to be honest. I mean, no, I don't really know much about them. I just know there's two areas uh, of the 13 wine-growing areas of Germany. Um, in, in Austria, they're, they're kind of on the western part. But they're called Lower Austria, and I'm going to assume that that has to do with like a river type of thing. That the upper part is the upper part of the river, and then the lower part's the lower part of Austria. Comptal is um, uh, just west of probably the more famous, the most well known is Wachau, or Wachau, I guess it is. Um, uh, part of Austria is a very small growing area, and then you have uh, Kremstal, and then Comptal after that. You know, to kind of north and east of it. Um, but if you, and I'll see if I'll have a, 
I'll remember to put the little map up, but you'll see everything's really concentrated in the western part of Austria. So it's kind of strange how the eastern side, it's not so much. Uh, and I'm not really sure why. Um, I, I do admit that my Austrian wine knowledge is pretty limited, other than that I know that most of the wine areas are to the west, and uh, Wachau and Kemp, 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 and Kemp, Kremstall are about the only ones that I recognize as far as names, and they've got 16 of them in Austria. The others, I looked at them, and I couldn't honestly tell you if I'd ever heard of them or seen anything of them. Um, and... Uh, uh, and that Gruner Veltliner is basically, or Groovy, is uh, the <clears throat> main grape from there. They do have Riesling. They have a couple other grapes uh, that they do. Um, Pinot Noir or, uh, 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 what is it, um, Burgunder. Uh, let me look it up here real quick. It, it's the same German name that they call Pinot Noir in, um, uh, whatchamacallit, in Germany. I don't know if it's here or not. Grape varieties. They'll do Sylvaner a little bit. Um, and then uh, Blaufrankisch is there. Blauberger and Zweigelt. That was in one of the other one of the other grape varieties Austria is known for is Zweigelt. And they also grow Riesling. Um, but anyway, so Gruner Veltliner. We'll go over that real quick. Gruner Veltliner is really, uh, really interesting because I didn't really actually look this up too much. Uh, you know how every grape seems to have like a parentage, and there the, for a very long time, uh, Traminer uh, was was known to be one of the parents. But interesting, interestingly enough, uh, there is another vine that was only very recently. Uh, found to be the other parent of it and it's uh, I thought I had it already set up here on, on the iPad but uh, it's it's a vine that n nobody knew what it, where it was and they kind of happened to find it by accident and um, uh, it the the vine they're assuming they're, they're thinking the vine is like 500 years old and there's only one vine and it's become a national monument. Recently, got it got uh, uh, vandalized, and now I don't know why I can't find the other name of this while I'm trying to just just talk and talk and talk. But uh, there's those other grapes. I cannot believe it's not where, it's right where it's supposed to be. <laughs> But anyway, it's, it's it's like they named the grape basically after the area of uh, of where they found this vine because they had they couldn't find the um, here we go Saint George and Rebe Saint George and Rebe or Saint George and Vine um, and somewhere I found that there there was a synonym for it but I'm not going to waste time looking for that so in essence uh, uh, and it's also considered native of of Austria now this particular winery. Uh, Goebbelsberger, um, not Gable, but Goebbelsberger, um, was the, the castle that, that, that has, that the, the vineyards are around, has been around since 1074. Now, at some point in time, uh, in the 1400s, no, maybe it was the 1700s. Um, the, uh, the Dukes of Austria, no, no, it was before 1440. Um, the Dukes of Austria, the Habsburgs, uh, were in charge of it for, for a while, uh, say in the 15th century. So early 1400s, uh, the Habsburgs as reigning Dukes of Austria took possession of the estate. Um, and, and this is one of those weird <clears throat> things about today is that, um, my mother talked about the Habsburgs a lot, and, and not that necessarily we were direct descendants, but apparently uh, family lore is that we are somehow related to the Habsburgs. So I've got like double royalty connections here and there. Um, so when I read this, it was, it was a little bit strange, you know, fateful, I guess, that I, I particularly bought this to your bottle. I'm not saying that my mother um, 
necessarily guided my hand in buying these wines because the next wine there's a little bit of stuff with that too um, but you know there's definitely some connection there I could have chosen any of the other Gruner Veltliners at uh, uh, Joe Saglin Benny's not that they have like walls of it but they had a lot of them and I just decided to buy this one for whatever the reason was there was no big reason I, it was more of a classic label rather than some of the fancier labels or more modern labels and I, you know, I just felt it was, it just was probably good. I looked it up, um, I, you know, so it had like at least some ratings. So I felt it was at least good quality. And, and Joe's uh, has good quality wine. So I pay, uh, the list price is $24.99. I paid 25% less. I left the receipt upstairs. I'm not going to go upstairs. It'll be on the lower third what I paid for it. Um, but, uh, or as you've already seen it. But $24.99 uh, list price. But on that day, it was 25% off at Joe's. And uh, so let's get into the wine because I've already rambled for about 16 minutes and hopefully I didn't lose everybody um, on the wine. Now, I can tell you that I opened these wines a little while ago. They were in the fridge overnight. Um, they should have warmed up a little bit, so closer to more of a serving temperature temperature rather than room temperature. I think I'm going to try to do that with my white wines. Um, to drink them like most people would drink them rather than just at room temperature. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I can tell you the aromatics from both wines have been filling the room. So let's let's check it out. Now the only other thing that that is going to be weird today is that I've just started taking a nasal spray with my allergies, and I did it a few hours ago actually. But there's still a bit of I don't know. It's it's going to it might affect the taste of a few things. But what was really weird is there's a there's a floral smell to the spray, which was kind of kind of threw me off the first time I did it. So really rich aromas, um, kind of a, a somewhat honey, um, melon type of stuff, cantaloupe more, I guess, anything else. Try that, you know, do the uh, Israeli. Something I, I tend to get with, with white wines like this, you know, the Rieslings and the Gruners. Um, not a chemical smell, not a plastic type smell, but there's, and I have yet to identify really what it is. I use these other words to kind of, you know, dance around what, what I guess the actual aroma is. It's just something I'm not recognizing, but there's, there's definitely, a, and, and I don't want people to think it's an off-putting smell. It's not. Is there something about it that I can never pinpoint? It might be this floral type of thing that sometimes I don't, that I can't identify. But there's there's this wax, wax like like the wax figures when you used to, when your kid went to the zoo and they get the wax animals out of the machine. I don't, I don't know if they still do that anymore, but when I was a kid they did. But you get that out of it. Let's check it out. Um, <clears throat> there's a good acidity to it. The palate really feels like it matches the nose. Um, there, there still is that it's, it's, um, there's, I, I, I know I always call it a pasta taste to it. Um, which I think I'm the only person in the world that ever describes white wine with pasta. Um, especially when I drink like sparkling wines, but it's the bakery type of thing. But, um, uh, it is kind of like for me, like getting pasta right out of the water. And kind of doing that little taste test, um, so uh, but there there still is a, there's a, not quite of a citrus thing, but there's a little bit of honey. But that was the very first taste, and if we remembered from Israelis, the first taste you get of a wine is more of a shock to the system. Unless you've been drinking, uh, the alcohol is going to shock you. So we're going to get another taste here. Oops. Um, yeah, I really get more of the more of a citrus aspect to the wine, uh, rather than the, that honeyed cantaloupe type of stuff. Um, uh, citrus and actually kind of a, more of an apple 
type of uh, flavor to it. Um, I really like it. It's very, very light. Um, it's definitely something that I know that mom would have liked. Uh, it, it's a style that she would have enjoyed. Um, I think she really would have liked this wine. Uh, I can, you know, I can definitely picture us, you know, at the table drinking it with, you know, whatever, whatever we were having some type of chicken. Uh, if we made, got some chicken made or, you know, there was, this definitely would have gone well with, uh, that fruit salad that we did, um, a couple times. And we, we have some white wines. We had that Mediterranean white that we all seem to have loved. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a good flavor to it. Uh, it's not overpowering. It's very light. It will go well with lighter dishes. This is not something that you're, it's not a heavy, heavy Chardonnay that you're going to, you know, pair up with something bold or something heavy. You know, this is definitely something for salads, chicken, um, fruit, some cheeses. Those are the things that you're going to really want to pair with this. Um, good summer wine. Um, there's there's a bit of Viognier uh, aroma to it. Um, and I, I read one of the things saying that it's like Riesling, Viognier, and I forgot what the other white grape was, all got together. Um so that, that's another way to really kind of describe Gruner Veltliner. And I know in our, our Psalm study groups, we don't really study this wine much, but I know that in some of the tasting notes, it's it's got like similarities with some of these other wines. So it can be throw people off when they're not expecting to taste it in a blind tasting. As I drink it more, it really really starting to like it a lot more it's good highly recommend it definitely recommend it whoops all right so let's move on to wine number two now i'm handling this a lot better than i thought i was going to all right so <clears throat> this wine uh you may recognize the label again i'll have a picture of it um, this is the John Joseph Prum 2010 Grocker Heimelreich, or I'm sorry, probably Himmelreich, Spätlese. Now, if you've watched the show, you'll know that I had this producer during the Christmas show, uh, but I had not the, uh, I had the, a different uh, vineyard. Uh, we had the Wellener Sonnenher, which I think that has something to do with sleep or something like that. Um, this winery has been around for a very long time, for over 400 years. The Prune family have had a presence in uh, Vellen for over 400 years. Uh, the estate was founded in 1911 by Johann Joseph Prune, and uh, then they split it up. Uh, it looks, I think there's like two. There's two different wineries involved with the name, with the, with the Prune name. But this has been around. It's one of those. It's one of the top producers of Riesling. Oh, this is a Riesling, by the way, um, in Germany. Uh, so if you buy one of these, it's going to be really good quality. Now the uh, price at, at Joe's was forty five ninety nine. Again, it was twenty five percent off when I had it. Now <clears throat> reading the history of this again, you know, I was like, well, what's you know, what is this? You know, uh, Grocker uh, Himmelreich. And uh, so it wasn't, I looked, I just looked, I just Googled that and I got one of the other wineries that, that has vineyards on this hill. Um, and I'll just read verbatim what it says. Uh, the name originates from the Celtic word for small hill. Only much later, once the original sense of the word got lost, the name received its Christian meaning, kingdom of God. It also symbolizes the very high and exposed location of the vineyard itself, the southwest exposed site produces very racy. Follow up, I won't go through. Kingdom of God. I don't talk about religion ever on this show. I don't really talk about religion to most people to begin with. Um, we had a minister do the service, not a Catholic priest. We were raised Catholic. Uh, we, we have a belief in God. And that, that's about as far as I will go on this because I'm not going to start preaching or anything. And if you are an atheist or agnostic, I no problem. I don't care. Um, I don't view anyone differently for their belief in whether they're 
uh, whatever religious beliefs or non-religious beliefs they have, I just view people as people. Um, kingdom of God, it just really, it really hit a little bit when I was prepping for the show, just that, you know, I told my dad that, you know, I'm not saying that mom guided my hand in buying these wines, but, you know, we believe she is in the kingdom of God, so, <clears throat> kind of, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so let's just get into the wine. Now, real quick about about reasons before I get too much farther, uh, and and we'll see if we'll see if the theory holds true. All right, first of all, what's what's Spätlese, or Spätlese, as some people will say, but as far as I know, it, it is Spätlese. Or you might even get the little shun there, the Spätlese, if it's being pr pronounced correctly. German is a fun language to pronounce. It sounds like crap. It sounds like you're spitting up, but it's it's. I just have a fun time pronouncing these names. Um, uh, there's a soccer player, his last name is Schweinsteiger. I just love saying his name. He's a good soccer player, by the way. Um, but anyway, um, Spätlese means late harvest in German. Now, late harvest is not like dessert wine. You know, that's, you know, the Baron, the uh, Baron, I was a, let's see, sorry, Baron, Chalk and Auslese, okay? You know, late, you know, uh, dry, dried up berries, uh, dried up late harvest berries or whatever it is, um, or very ripe. But this, this is, this is, these are picked at least seven days after what's considered ripe for the grape. So there's a higher, there's a higher sugar level, which means you can have a higher potential alcohol level. Now, the, the, one of the common misperceptions of, of these, the qualitatsvine, uh, I'm sorry, the product, um, the product levels of like cabinet, spätlese, auslese, uh, and so on, is that it, it denotes a sweetness level, and it, it it's not an actually it's it's actually a ripeness level. Um, it does tend to hold true as you go higher up that the wines tend to be sweeter. Um, a spätlese can be sweet or dry, or trocken. Um, one way to kind of identify or, or kind of get an idea of whether it's going to be sweet or dry before you drink it is looking at the, um, the alcohol level. In this particular case, it's 9% alcohol. So it's a very low alcohol wine. Um, that means that not all the sugars may have been fermented. So there should be a sweetness level to it. Not overly sweet necessarily, but there should be a sweetness level to it. If this was like closer to 12 or 13 percent, because it should have been able to ferment out to at least 13 percent, or at least 12, probably 13, maybe even 14. I'm not really sure on the spate laser uh, sugar levels, but at least I would say get the 13 would, would not a problem. And then it would be a totally dry riesling. Okay, so I know that's one of the things that confuses consumers a lot as to, you know, is it sweet or dry? Because I like dry or I like sweet, not the other. Look at the alcohol level before you buy it. Um, and that, that hopefully is a guideline. So we're going to test that out right now. So I do get really more of a, that, that plastic wax type of aroma more than anything else. Maybe a bit of a golden apple. Not much else. I mean, there might be a floral aspect to it, but I don't get a whole lot of anything else, which, again, I struggle with white wines. I don't know why, but I feel like I'm getting green beans. That waxiness, you know? And it might be, I'm, I'm just pulling it. I cannot believe that light just went out. These batteries should be lasting way longer. Okay, whatever, we'll just keep going. But anyway, um, no much on the aromas. Yeah, these lights are going real strong. I can't even see the individual lights. I was seeing the individual LEDs on that one, so I don't know why. They all were charging for weeks, fully charged. Right, let's move on.
definitely a sweetness level to this. Um, this is not a dry Riesling. So 9% alcohol, Riesling, German, or it could be anywhere, especially as a spate lace on it. It's probably going to be a sweeter wine rather than a drier wine. It can be made dry, remember that. But I get some honey, honey aspects to it. Some fruit to it, kind of. Um, I want to say, like, peach type of flavors, maybe even a little bit like like um, tangerine, tangerine, like orange and tangerine were more I think more than anything else than than the peach. Um, really tasty, got a little bit of sweetness again, not overly sweet, but if somebody's like, "Well, I want a sweet wine," well, you know what? This will work. This will totally work. Um, they mentioned racy on, on this description from from uh, another from another uh, uh, winery, and um, you know I, I can see that there's there's racy. There's also body to it. There's there's a not a heaviness, but there's there's a fullness to it. Um, it really coated the mouth, uh, so it's, it's it's a I think it's an excellent wine. You know it, it's it should be. It's not cheap. Um, you know, it's $46, and, and I could see really, you know, getting into this wine a lot and, and making sure you're pairing it with some foods. Um, you know, white wines, a lot of times, like, you can totally drink. I think it's just, you know, quaffable and just drink it, like, sitting outside while it's hot and all that. And you could do this, but I really think the food will really help because there's that sweetness level. You know, if you don't really want it as something refreshing because it's hot outside because um, it, it kind of will bog you down a bit. But you know, definitely pairing it with some foods. Uh, still similar to I would say with fruit salads. Could really get that fruit. You know, really combine that fruit. Um, uh, regular salads. Maybe not so much with with chicken dishes, but maybe if you were uh, since it's a little bit more full bodied, maybe having it with some other fish dishes. You know, that type of stuff. I think it'd be really nice. I like it a lot. I like it a whole lot. So if you ever see, like I know the Christmas episode, if you see this producer, buy it. You're not going to go wrong. You're not going to be disappointed in the wine. Another reason why I bought, why I went with this one because I'd had it before. I knew it was a different, I knew it was a different uh, vineyard or area, and uh, so I knew, but I knew it'd be a good good producer. Well, that that's really going to do it for the show. Um, you know, I just really want to want to thank everybody during this period of time that 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 has uh, talked to me, called me, texted me, messaged me. You know, been there in person. Um, you know, I had some good friends that were there at the hospital a lot. Um, a couple of my best friends growing, you know, in, in high school and college were were there. Um, really want to thank them. They don't they don't ever watch the show, so. But just want to be, put it out there to thank them. And, uh, you know, I, I thought a lot about what I wanted to say, what I didn't want to say. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, I just didn't want to go through a whole litany of stuff. I just, you know, wanted to have some wines that, that I felt would be really great that mom would like and uh, kind of explain what happened. Um, and it's time to, you know, it's time to resume everything. It's, you know, I can't, you can't sit there and, and, and uh, <clears throat> you know, be miserable you know, uh, we all die. We're all going to die. It's one, one, of the, one of the big things that we all know is going to happen. We're all going to die at some point. Uh, even if we don't want to accept the fact that our loved ones pass away uh, or that we're going to. And, you know, life has to move on. But we can remember them. Uh, and we have a portrait in, in the house of, of a picture so we can both, uh, every day, you know, see her. And uh, you guys want to thank everybody. Thank you for all your support. Um, next week we got the anniversary show. That should be a lot of fun. You know, get back to having some more fun here. Um, and uh, uh, the the Rockport show that uh, had a lot of fun making that one, and, and uh, it's going to be kind of goofy. And then we got some other stuff. We got Indian wine. I got Italian wine. Uh, I've got P 
people I want to bring on the show. I want I got places I want to go visit. They're in the San Antonio area um, uh, to go to, to uh, hang not hang out, but visit and, and talk about what they're doing. Uh, I want to hit some more Texas wineries. Um, have some fun with that. Uh, try to get back on track to doing these Google Hangouts uh, during the Texas Twitter wine Twitter stuff. Uh, I didn't do, participate this month, obviously. Um, but June and July are coming up, and and I might I might try to participate with those. Uh, really kind of depends on my schedule. My work schedule is going to be kind of crazy for a while, so um, I still plan to keep putting these things out on Monday. Though this show probably came out late Monday night or Tuesday. The anniversary show I do plan to release it on Tuesday because that's the actual anniversary instead of on Monday, which is Memorial Day. All right, that's going to do it. Um, as always, click the links above to friend me up. Hit the donate button. Uh, if you're watching on Roku, thank you very much. Hopefully you're watching the iFu TV feed. Please watch that one because they support me a lot and they give me lots of props and they put me on their website. Check out iFu TV. They got lots of other videos, but I, only, I think I'm like the only wine video they have. Um, is it subscribe to iTunes. However you want to do it. The more, the better. Tell your friends, everyone, and uh, we'll see everyone again next time.